الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على من بعث رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن شاء الله we continue with the tafsir of Surah Al Imran from verse 19 we uh, did part of verse 19 last week so verse 19 was where Allah subhanahu wa taala says إن الدين عند الله الإسلام Indeed, the true deen in the sight of Allah is Islam. <clears throat> and we were discussing just this <clears throat> beginning of this ayah. What does it mean that the deen in the sight of Allah is Islam? What, what is the meaning of that? We covered um, five points by which Islam is unique, distinguished from other ways, from other religions, if you like. Um, we covered those five points, so the, num the sixth point is that and these unique points were that it has a number of features that the deen, deen al-Islam is compatible with human nature, with the fitra and it develops the human nature, it develops the fitra and the fitra is ready to accept this deen and it develops the human being with, with its guidance. So. Point number six was that this deen has an impact on the followers and its guidance. The, that the deen has an impact on the followers and its guidance is able to be implemented. So its guidance and the prescribed tarbiyah or practice of self-development of the nafs should produce people that are able to put a barrier between evil thoughts and desires and their own nafs. So there is a defense mechanism being produced in people who undergo the tarbiyah of Islam, who follow the guidance of Islam. One of the things that it produces is people who are able to control their nafs, people who are able to put a barrier, a defense mechanism between evil thoughts or evil um, um, influences or evil whispers of the shaitan and between their own nafs. This is a sign of a true deen. Ultimately, what is the point of a religion or a deen or a set of laws or guidance if it cannot um, develop the human being to have control of his or herself? So Islam has this and it does so in two ways. One, it encourages, it gives us motivation for Jannah, for the good, for reward, for paradise for pleasure, for eternal pleasure, joy and happiness. And secondly, it motivates us to stay away from or it threatens us with the uh, threat of pain, punishment, sadness, anxiety, regret, eternal regret, eternal punishment. These are the two ways in which Islamic guidance motivates the individual. These are the two ways that Islamic guidance moves the individual, tarheeb and targheeb, towards implementing the guidance of Islam, of the Qur'an, in order for the person to have, have self-control. Number seven is that Islam is merciful and easy to practice. This is another um, distinguishing feature of Islam, of the way of this deen, that it is easy to practice and it's merciful. It's easy on the believers to practice Islam. Islam focuses on those things that are best for your own benefit, for your own development. Having halal and pure food is something for your own benefit, something that is easy to do. It's not, it's not difficult to make food halal. It is not difficult to pray regularly. It only takes a few minutes to pray. It is not difficult to fast. In the beginning, yes, maybe, but once you get used to it, it's easy to fast. It's not difficult to pay 2.5% of your earnings, of your wealth, only 2.5%. You pay much more in taxes, but 2.5% of your wealth to pay, to give in charity, is not difficult. So all of the major things in Islam, everything in Islam, is easy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and, and this is... You know, many of the commands of Islam focuses on those things which bring you benefit, which actually rectifies your condition, 
which actually strengthens you as a human being and, and brings you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, islah, it rectifies your condition so that you are prepared to enter Jannah and you are prepared to avoid the hellfire. And it does so in such an easy way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made all his commands in such a way that whatever he's commanded us to do, whatever he's made fard, wajib, these things are beneficial at the end of the day for ourselves, in the dunya and the akhirah. Most benefit is in the akhirah, but even in the dunya, we enjoy the benefit of that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that whoever uh, follows this deen, whoever follows Allah's command, he will give them a good life. You know, their lives will be, it, you may not be the wealthiest all the time, there are rich Muslims, there are poor Muslims, but they'll be content, they'll be happy, they'll, be, they'll have stability, they'll have meaning in life. One of the crises of the West is the loss of meaning. There's no meaning in life, there's no purpose. Because if you're all, you know, if there's no God and if, if everything, even Christianity has become, you know, it's just metaphorical, the Bible's just metaphor. And everything's just evolved out of nothing. There's no meaning in life, there's no purpose. If there's no creator, no God, what is the purpose of life? But Islam gives you this purpose in life. It gives you meaning. Human beings cannot survive without meaning. But it does so in an easy way, in a way that you are able to implement it, in a way that you can do this. It's, it's, it's easy to do. And the deen is merciful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا جَعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not made for you in this deen any haraj. Haraj, they say, a restriction, constriction. This deen is not restrictive. It's not hardship. It doesn't constrict you. You're free to, you're free to trade. You're free to do business. Only a small number of things are haram. In your food, you're free to eat and drink whatever you want. Except for alcohol and pork. That's it. Two things. Halas. Everything else halal. Two things out of the thousands and thousands of types of food and drink, only two things is haram. In business, in trade, you're allowed to make money, you're allowed to invest, you're allowed to uh, trade, buy and sell, open up businesses. It's just avoiding a few haram things, that's it. So you're allowed to wear whatever clothes you want, except for one or two things which are haram. So everything the believer is allowed to do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not made in this deen any restriction, any constriction. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرِ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسْرِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants for you, Allah wants for you ease, and He does not want for you hardship. This is the verse in Surah Al-Baqarah, after the verses of uh, Ramadan, of fasting. Allah, Allah does not want hardship for you. People have this misunderstanding of religion, of deen, even Muslims. Many Muslims who don't pray, who don't fast, who don't practice, they have this idea that it's very difficult. It's too hard for me. It's too much to ask. It's really difficult. But it's not. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says it's easy. He wants ease for you, not difficulty. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says in the Qur'an, يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ أَنْ يُخَفِّفَ عَنْكُمْ وَخُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ ضَعِيفًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to lighten it for you. يُخَفِّفَ عَنْكُمْ He wants to lighten the burden from you. And insan, human beings have been created ضَعِيفًا Weak. Allah knows we are weak. Allah knows if we kept the salah, 50 salahs a day, if we had to pray 50 times a day, how many people would be praying? Hardly anybody. Allah knows this. Allah wants to eat, make things easy for us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not burden a soul beyond its capability, beyond its capacity. And this is not just in the permanent, you know, human beings have a permanent incapability incapacity to do certain things. We have limited strength, we have a limited ability, we have a limited ability to control ourselves. 
If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, asked us to pray a hundred times a day, it would have been impossible for us, just physically. If he, if he told us to fast 60 days without breaking for even iftar, no food at daytime and nighttime, even for two weeks, would have been impossible. So human beings have a limited capacity, limited ability. And Allah does not burden you beyond that capacity. There are no rules in Islam which anyone can turn around and say, this is beyond my capacity as a human being. There's no such rules. And even when your capacity, ability, is temporarily taken away, or for some reason is temporarily your capacity goes down, your ability goes down, is diminished. For example, when you're ill, you're relieved, there's, there's concession in ibadah. When you're ill, or you know, if, if making wudu with water makes you more ill, or exacer ex exacerbates your illness, then you can do tayammu. If you're traveling, instead of praying four rakah, dhuhr, you can pray two rakah. Everything's lightened for you. In so many situations, things are lightened for you in the sharia. So this deen is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to make it easy for you. It's ease and mercy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ Even here in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that fear Allah, have taqwa of Allah, as much as you are able to do. مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ As much as you are able to do. Fear Allah, because we can never fear Allah the way He should be feared. The way He should be respected and honored. And the way He should be obeyed, we can never do that. In, in the perfect sense. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do as much as is possible for you. Fear Allah, have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as much as is possible for you in your capacity. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna deena yusrun. Indeed this deen is easy. Yusrun is easy. This deen is easy. وَلَنْ يُشَادَّ الدِّينَ أَحَدٌ إِلَّا غَلَبَهُ and no, and whoever overburdens himself in his religion will not be able to continue in that way. It will, it will flatten him. You know, it will, it will defeat him. If somebody becomes extreme in the deen and he wants to do everything, overburden himself, things that the deen doesn't ask him or her to do, he will not be able to continue doing it. He will be, over, he will be defeated. He will be overcome. Then the Prophet said, فَسَدِّدُوا وَقَارِبُوا وَأَبْشِرُوا So he said, so you should not go to any extremes, stay in the middle, take a middle course, and try to be near to perfection, and receive the good tidings, that you will be rewarded. وَاسْتَعِينُوا بِالْغَدْوَةِ وَالْرَوْحَةِ وَشَيْءٍ مِّنَ الدُّلْجَةِ And gain strength by worshipping in the mornings, uh, the afternoons and during the last hours of the nights. So Allah uh, the Prophet ﷺ is saying religion is easy. He's encouraging you, don't go to extremes in the religion. Don't try and do everything. Take a middle course. Do things that you are able to do. The Prophet ﷺ said the most beloved deeds in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not the largest deeds, is not the greatest deeds. It's not the quantity, it's, it's the regular deed, the consistency. The, reg the deed that you do regularly, even though it's small, even though it's something very small, that is the most beloved in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number eight, Islam, these are the distinguishing features of Islam as a deen. Islam, number eight is Islam doesn't separate between its laws and if you can call it government or political authority, there's no separation in the deen between its laws and political authority, if you like, or government. What does this mean? It means that Islam has given us guidance, not only for the masjid, not only for our salah and our fasting and our charity and inheritance and family and personal law, etc., but it's given us guidance that are related to society, how to run society, how to govern 
communities how to run publicly, how to run the society and community at a political level as well. Because it doesn't make any sense to have a set of laws, a set of guidance that is not backed up, that is not protected, right? By, by, by the ruling authority. If, if you have a set of laws that can't be implemented in the courts, right? You have lots of laws to do with business, transactions, contracts, right? Uh, to do with inheritance, to do with rights of marriage, etc., etc., to do with disputes, to do with punishment, criminal law, public law. So many different uh, legal rulings are, are contained in Sharia. If none of these laws can be implemented by the courts because there's no authority, or if the government doesn't implement any of this, what is the point of these laws? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveal them? And what will happen to that community? What will happen is these laws will become, you know, non-relevant, just, just as they are in many, many Muslim lands today, because you can't implement it. And this is what happens when you separate deen from politics, deen from, not politics, but deen from authority. When you separate deen from political authority that can protect the deen, that can implement the deen, then what happens is you lose a lot of the guidance, the, the, the rulings, the laws, they're not, being, they're not able to be implemented. You can't live as a community according to the full guidance, according to the freedom of your deen. You can't live freely and practice your deen properly. This is what happens. But Islam has given us legislation for our government life, political life, as well as our religious Government life is also religious, but as well as our ritual worship, if you like. And there's no contradiction. 95% of our history, Islamic history, 95% of our Islamic history, political authority and deen, Islam, Islamic law, was, was joined together. There was no separation. There was no separation. Muslim societies, their core central guiding legislation was, was Islam, Sharia. This is how societies run, because it's totally, perfectly logical. You can't have individuals who live by a code of conduct, live by a set of laws, live by a set of principles and guidance and laws, and then when they come together as a collective, they abandon those laws. The laws are there for us as individuals, but us as a community as well. And this is the best way to preserve that community, its practices, and allow it freedom to live according to that guidance and to create unity amongst that community. This is the best way. Number nine is that the clarity of the core foundations. Of course, number eight, this is related to in a Muslim society. This is related to in a Muslim society, Muslim lands. Number nine, the clarity of the core foundations of the deen. This is something unique to Islam. In the way that number one, the foundational pillars, the foundational rules and laws, beliefs and practices has been explained, clarified and preserved. This is very unique in Islam. And this is achieved by repeating them in different passages of the Quran, in different ways, in different surahs but in a very clear way and by repeating it in the sunnah through the Prophet ﷺ in such a way that no, um, there is no misinterpretation of Tawheed. You know, in Islam, there's no sect in Islam or group or madhab that says there's more than one God. Is there? In 14 centuries, there's no groups, no sects, no madhabs, no aqidah groups who say that there is more than one God. No, none. Why? Because this fundamental foundation of the deen, of the religion, has been preserved with clear expressions through the ayahs of the Qur'an and repeated again and again throughout the Qur'an. So this remains absolutely clear. It doesn't become corrupted. There's no misinterpretation. There's no changing of the text, it's preserved because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has 
promised to preserve the text of the Quran and this deen. So this is unique in Islam, that it's impossible to change the fundamentals of this deen. Nobody's going to say there's no madhab, no groups who say you don't have to pray. Salah is a fundamental practice, pillar of practice of the deen. Up to now, 14 centuries, nobody has come up with the misinterpretation that Salah is nafal. You don't have to pray. Or that fasting is not fard. Or that zakat is not fard. Nobody has come up with that. So this is a unique feature of the deen that is core fundamental practices and beliefs are preserved in such a clear way throughout its text and throughout the practice of its community. And, and this is obviously um, the main, main thing of this ayah is to show how this is true for Islam but it hasn't remained true for other re revealed books and religions because it's changed. In other deen, this has changed. Even Tawheed has been changed in other religions. So these are the nine distinguishing features of our deen um, that makes it so appropriate and suitable for all times and all places until the end of time, until the day of judgment. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues in this verse, وَمَا اخْتَلَفَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ إِلَّا مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَهُمُ الْعِلْمُ إِلَّا مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَهُمُ الْعِلْمُ بَغْيًا بَيْنَهُمْ Those who were given the scripture did not dispute amongst themselves except out of mutual envy until knowledge came to them. وَمَنْ يَكْفُرْ بِآيَاتِ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ سَرِيعُ الْحِسَابِ Whoever denies Allah's signs, then surely Allah is swift in reckoning. So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes, uh, the, the point about this ayah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about is to explain and point out two main things. One is the cause of the negative attitude of the people of the book, Ahlul Kitab. As you know, the people of the book in the Quran are referred to as those communities that receive the revelation, the Jews and the Christians. So the first point is, what is the cause of this negative, why did many of them reject the Prophet ﷺ, Prophet Muhammad, why did they not believe in him, why did they not believe in the Quran? One of the negative attitude, what was behind this attitude of rejection, what was behind the cause, this is what this ayah explains. And number two, it explains their misunderstandings and misinterpretations of their own books. So one is their attitude towards Islam, what's behind that, them rejecting it. And number two, what is, the, what is behind them differing and disputing and changing their books and changing their beliefs and practices amongst themselves. And the style of the ayah presumes a question or presumes that the thing it is describing you know, about their differences, why they differed, is, is, it presumes that this is already well known amongst the people. Because if you look at the style of the ayah, it says, وَمَا اخْتَلَفَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ إِلَّا مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَهُمُ الْعِلْمِ So it says in the English translation, those who were given the scripture did not dispute except out of mutual envy. So it's almost like this is an answer to a question or it's, an, it's a statement about something that's well known amongst the people. It's like explaining, that, look, the only reason they differed is because of X, Y, and Z. The only reason they differed amongst themselves is because of this. But that style of speech would only come if there's a question <clears throat> or if something is well known amongst the people. It also compares, because just now, it's the same ayah, ayah number 19. Because just now in the beginning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الدِّينَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ الْإِسْلَامِ That the only deen that's recognized in the sight of Allah is Islam. And then it comes and says, the people of the book, they, dis they differed. They became disunited. They differed about the book, they differed amongst themselves about the main fundamental uh, usul al-deen, the fundamental foundations, the pillars of belief and practice. They differed on that. 
So it juxtaposes, it, it kind of puts Islam here and the other religions. One, you're talking about Islam, which has just been revealed anew with a new prophet and a new book. There's no differences. It's united. It's one. It's authentic. It's true. It's here, right here in front of you. The messenger is living amongst you. This is talking in Medina. Whereas you have the followers of the previous revelations, now many centuries have passed since the original time of those revelations, but they have become fragmented. The, the, the texts have become changed, etc. So this is also a comparison you can see in this ayah. And also by pointing this out, in Nadina in Allah Islam, in the face of knowing that there are previous revelations or the communities of those uh, who received those previous revelations, they are in Medina. It's hinting to the fact that no other religion exists at that time when the Prophet ﷺ was alive that is suitable for all people until the end of time except Islam. No other way is suitable. The reason why is because of the changes and the misinterpretations. Those books have been changed, those books have been misinterpreted or changes have been made to those books and therefore they can no longer be relied upon. This is so logical and easy to understand that if your access to the truth has been changed or blocked or in such a way that it is no longer representing the original message or the original truth of that message then you have to go to a source where you can find that truth, where you can once again have access to authentic revelation and that is the Qur'an. It is not that everything is so different, no, it's the same source. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the Torah, the Injil and Allah revealed the Qur'an. Those two sources have been changed and therefore you can't rely on those anymore. Secondly, they were only there for a limited time, a limited time period in history and also they were there for a limited community. So, because of this, you now have to come to a source which hasn't been changed. An unchanged, reliable, authentic source. And that's Muhammad Wasallam. That's the Qur'an. This is so common sense. This is so logical to understand. And, you know, the fact of the change of text is not me as a Muslim here criticizing Christianity or or Judaism, no, we, 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 you know, in Islam, in the Quran, it simply invites people. It doesn't force them. It doesn't, um, it doesn't say they're not allowed to follow their own beliefs, etc. And and we don't do th we don't do that either. It's not out of any disrespect. This is affirmed by biblical scholars that the Bible has been changed. This is, this is not something the Muslims charge the Christians with. This is something that experts, ac academics from their own faith, from their own tradition, as well as in Western academia, this is something very well established and accepted. You know, you have someone like um, Bart Ehrman who says there are hundreds of thousands of Bible manuscripts, hundreds and thousands of Bible manuscripts. And there are more differences between those manuscripts in terms of changes than there are manuscripts. So say there are 50,000 manuscripts, there are more differences, if you, if you put all the manuscripts together and count where they differ from one to another, Right? They don't match up. He said there are more differences than there are manuscripts. This is very well established. Nobody denies this. None of the biblical scholars who study it, whether they're Christians or non-Christians, no one denies this. Even the Christians, if you speak to them, they'll say they still have the truth. It doesn't matter if the text has been changed. The spirit of the truth is there, etc. You know, the teachings are still there. So they have their explanation for it, but the fact is what this entails according to the Qur'an is that you can no longer rely upon that. Yeah. So here 
the ayah points out why the Quran is um, pointing out these things that they disagreed amongst themselves they changed the text etc and therefore it's also a warning for believers you know the importance of not misinterpreting the Quran the importance of staying united the importance of not arguing about the meanings of the Quran the importance of having the right training the right qualifications to interpret the Quran this is very important and we must be very careful like Abu Bakr radiallahu an he said that which which heaven which sky will will protect me and which earth will will hold me if i say something about the book of allah without knowledge this is abu bakr radiallahu an the closest companion of the prophet sallam and the highest ranking human being after the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam you know so the warning is there that we need to take this seriously we shouldn't we should be very careful about interpreting the quran we shouldn't differ we shouldn't interpret the quran in a way that goes against the norm the the deen the arabic language the ulum of the quran the tafsir of the quran which is accepted this is very important that we don't cause division amongst the ummah by misinterpreting the quran or by having some kind of bias with which we approach the quran and we do an interpretation that actually the quran doesn't admit of and 14 centuries later we still have the original same quran alhamdulillah the sunnah is preserved it's not just the quran because one of the criticisms of interpretation is how do you know what the text means you know and this is a crisis post modernism there is no real truth to any text because the author there is no author it's 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 like um, the phrase is the death of the author and the birth of the reader in other words every reader interprets what the text means according to their own subjective understanding and and approach to the text so the, uh, i mean to some extent that can be true with general texts because you can read a text in many ways how do you know what the author really meant yeah there there is a range where there is a flexibility of that but the quran why this doesn't work with the quran one because it's clear arabic language yeah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that you know it's it's bayyana um it's mubin yeah it's arabic it's the highest form of arabic so there is a clarity there is an eloquence there is a clarity of communication in the language itself secondly the quran explains itself one part of the quran explains another part of the quran so allah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself explained what one part means in another part of the quran thirdly allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't just send a book in a package and said you know there you go lots of copies and go and implement it no he sent the messenger prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam with the quran to explain the tubayyina you know to explain to people what has been revealed so nobody can say that in the quran this means this salah means for example salah means just dua this is one of the meaning in arabic language salah means dua i don't have to pray just make dua no the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam explained to you what salah means in his life through the hadith through his practice so you have the text but you have the interpretation of the text in the life of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in that way the quran is preserved from misinterpretation so nobody can say we didn't understand what the quran meant when it said pay zakat we didn't know it's 2.5% no because the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam explains all of the deen through his practice through his speech through the hadith the sunnah is also preserved so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised to preserve this deen and there's many many other ways is preserved but those are just some of the ways that these things are preserved so this ayah explains to us that the people of the book they differed amongst themselves and the main cause is envy over each other baghiyan out of rebellion and envy and it happened after knowledge came to them i e the revelation there's three ways in which they differed one they differed amongst themselves within each other within christianity within judaism you'll see different sects 
Number two, they differed against each other. The Jews will say they don't believe in Jesus. They'll say the Christians are misguided in the sense that they're following a false prophet. And the Christians will say, well, the Jews didn't accept Jesus, therefore they're wrong, etc. And number three, they differ against the truth, against recognizing the truth of the Quran and the Prophet Muhammad They both, they're united in saying that this is not true. The Quran is not true. The Prophet Muhammad is not true. So this is the reason why Muslims are encouraged to guard against false interpretations, to guard against disunity when it comes to the deen, when it comes to the Quran and the Sunnah. You know, our differences are small. I'll come back to that as we just wrap up, inshallah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, um, that they didn't differ except until knowledge came to them. And the reason was mutual envy. Huh? وَمَنْ يَكْفُرْ بِآيَاتِ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ سَرِيعٌ الْحِسَابِ And whoever denies Allah's signs, then surely Allah is swift in reckoning. He's quick to take hisab, to reckon, to account. This means he's also quick to punish. You know, he's very quick to do this on the Day of Judgment, or in the dunya or in the akhirah, but mainly on the Day of Judgment. He is very quick to punish take account of people who deny the clear, clear signs of revelation. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayah, one of the things is that, you know, what we're warned against is people differing and changing in misinterpreting the text, right? So someone may say, yeah, but look at Islam, it's the same thing. You've got so many madhabs, so many aqidah, so many groups, you're also divided. Yes, but there's a big difference. Even in Islam, Islamic law, only four, if you like in the Sunnis, there's only four main, you can say five, maximum six, but the four main madhabs have survived. Right? So even in Islamic law, through 14 centuries, there are only four schools. Right? If you, in the beginning there were more, and throughout history there were more and less. But even out of the four, there's only, you know, two or three of them are major. And if you look at most of history, most of the political authorities followed one of the madhabs. But the other thing about the Islamic law schools is they don't differ on fundamentals. Their difference is on secondary issues. They'll differ on where to hold the hand. They'll differ on how many takbirat on the Eid Salah. They'll differ on what is, how many sunnas there are in wudu. They will not differ on, do you need wudu for salah? They will not differ on, you know, is salah wajib? Is it a fard? No. They will not differ on that. They will not differ on any of the fundamental pillars of practice. Any of the core teachings of Islam, they will not differ on. So you have to understand that when people say, yes, but you have schools of thought. Yes, we do. But they differ on um, secondary issues and they differ where difference Allah has allowed difference due to the nature of Arabic language and due to the nature of the text there is some differences allowed and this is a mercy to the ummah this is a mercy to the ummah that there are different opinions on the same thing but in terms of the actual core practices there's no difference same in aqidah only what two maximum three schools of aqidah, main, main schools of aqidah, of belief. And even there, they don't differ on any of the fundamentals. They don't differ on oneness, tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't differ on the uh, messengers, belief about the messengers, or the day of judgment, or the angels, or the, or, or the uh, divine decree. They don't differ on these things. The differences are on secondary issues which doesn't, most of it doesn't matter. You will not be questioned about this on the Day of Judgment. So yes, there are different groups even within Islam, but these things are mainly based on secondary differences. This is very important to understand. But the important thing is for us to take lesson is not to divide amongst ourselves, not to argue, with the Quran, argue on the Qur'an with other people and not to misinterpret or try to interpret the Qur'an without qualification, without the prerequisite training, etc. And to focus on the unity of the Ummah, this is very important. 
So we'll, we'll uh, stop here, uh, inshallah, for today. And uh, we'll continue next week from verse number 20, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Or if, if there's any quick questions, we can take it, inshallah, if there's any questions.